show talk session where we meet Dr. Roland Fleck, the joint CEO of one of the 15 largest exhibition companies in the world, uh, Nuremberg Messe. So welcome, Dr. Fleck, and thank you for taking your time to talk to us today. Uh, so could you tell us about your early life and studies and your very first career ambitions? What, what fired you on your, your path to the future? Yes, when, when, I, when I was 18, 19 years old, at uh, that time I finished my, my secondary school and I got my university entrance diploma at that time. And I had, uh, I had two targets at that time, uh, a dream and a realistic goal, two different ones. The dream was because at that time already I had a passion for classical music um, and uh, therefore I wanted to be a conductor in my life. Uh, but my cognition at that time was that I don't have the suitable skills for this profession. So mm -hmm. um, I was forced uh, to focus on the second uh, goal I had, a realistic goal. Uh, the goal was to strive for a leading position in business and politics. And um, uh, this was where my goal was, I wanted to have a job where I can uh, design something, I, where I can shape th something, where I can create something worthful for the, for the future. Um, so I went to uh, the University of uh, Erlangen Nuremberg at that time, made my studies in business, business administration, in politics, um, in uh, political sciences, and I got my diploma at that time. And after that, uh, I uh, built uh, my graduate degree uh, and started in parallel um, with my career uh, in a banking institute at that time. Um, it was Hypo Bank. Um, with a trainee program. And at that time, uh, it was my, my first step in my professional life. I've spent uh, 18 months uh, in 10 different cities uh, uh, in Germany uh, and in other countries. Among them at that time were Berlin and, important for you, London. My first experience with London. One, min one month in London was excellent at that time. Excellent. And how did your um, distinguished career in banking, finance, politics, uh, and you, of course, served as deputy mayor of Nuremberg uh, and were a councillor for economic affairs for the city. H how did that equip you for the challenges of uh, perhaps more mundane industry, the events industry, and uh, the challenges at the Mesa? Yes. Um, um... After 10 years in the, in, the, in the banking sector, yes, I was elected uh, vice mayor for economic affairs in the city of Nuremberg. I served there 15 years in the city government um, and uh, already in the city hall, my passion was to build up international relations, international relations for the city and for the region at that time. And, uh, uh, to give you an example, um, uh, I'd like to, to, to add two, to mention two projects. Um, I had uh, uh, at that time um, two of my favorite projects. Um, they re were related to the logistics sector. Mm -hmm. um, the first was, uh, it's called China Land Bridge. China Land Bridge, a railway connection between Chengdu in uh, um, Western China um, and Nuremberg in Germany. And the second um, project was uh, the freight railway connection uh, between Nuremberg uh, Freight Center on the one hand and uh, the so-called Quadrante Europa. Uh, it's uh, the freight, uh, European freight hub for Southern Europe uh, in Verona in Italy, in Northern Italy. And both projects, um, I think both projects made it possible for me to collect experiences um, in international negotiations. And I remember very well, I was 10, 12 times in China, in Beijing, uh, to negotiate with uh, a professor. It's, he was Wang Derong. He was vice president of the CCTA, the China Communication and Transportation Association. Uh, and he was responsible for the railway um, development, railway network development in China and for the international 
connections as well. So we negotiated often and uh, was a wealthful experience for me. And the same was with Verona. Um, at that time, I often was there and we negotiated uh, uh, this uh, connections via the Alps uh, between uh, Bavaria and the north of Italy. And uh, the good thing is that both projects were successful. Today, we have one times per week a train between Chengdu and Nuremberg, and Nuremberg and Chengdu. And we have a daily connection uh, between Verona and Nuremberg as well. So uh, it was uh, very successful. And I'm sure you'd be very interested in the UFI sessions from 2019, their Congress, where they discussed the Great Silk Route and uh, yes, yes, and of course, and bringing yes, these experiences were very valuable for me um, for my occupation later as CEO of Nuremberg Messe, because uh, in this business, you know, we also have often international uh, negotiations, um, and uh, so uh, I could uh, I can, it was possible for me to build on these experiences in my former profession. Yes. Did any of that prepare you for the scale of the challenge with the pandemic? And, um, you know, you've now helped oversee 10 years of growth since taking over as CEO um, in 2011. Um, so how have you managed to bring some of that, those years of experience uh, in dealing with big issues to the Nuremberg Messe to deal with the pandemic and the effects of it on the business? Yeah, interesting question. Yes, question. Yes, um, our advantage um, is uh, that we had, if you look to the past, a steady growth before the pandemic. Many several decades of steady growth before the pandemic, and especially a very dynamic growth uh, in the last ten years of my responsibility as CEO of Nuremberg Messe, together with my dear colleague Peter Ottmann. Um, and um, before um, my responsibility as CEO, you know, I served 15 years from 1996 to 2011 as member of the supervisory board of Nuremberg Messe. During my time as vice mayor, I was uh, in charge of uh, this position as a member of the supervisory board of Nuremberg Messe. And so I attended the success story of Nuremberg Messe in different positions, in different responsibilities for now 25 years um, in this year, uh, 2021. And uh, we had many highlights uh, in this time, in these 25 years. We had many investments uh, in our venue, one of our new halls you see in the background. Um, we had an organic growth of our portfolio, step by step, and uh, we had a global expansion during these uh, decades, a global expansion with uh, own developments and with acquisitions as well. So we had 2007, I remember, we had China and North America. Uh, 2009, we had Italy and Brazil. Uh, 2013, we uh, went to India at that time. And uh, 2019, uh, we acquired uh, the market-leading uh, exhibition company in Greece. It's mm -hmm. called Forum. So it was also an important step. And uh, this long success story uh, is, from my point of view, the basis why we are able uh, to tackle the challenge uh, of uh, the corona pandemic uh, in a, uh, compared with others in a good manner as an message. Yes, I suppose you... Uh, you're almost a living embodiment of the Mesa system because coming from the regional political scene where your politicians seem to certainly get the power of the trade fair industry to deliver for the economy, it's a problem here in the UK where I'm based. We often have problem, uh, problems convincing our politicians of the value of what we're doing. So it's great that you would be able to hit the ground running having seen the affairs of the, the Mesa from the outside first uh, and taking part through the board, of course. So um, that's uh, a great example of that holistic uh, management, I would call it. Would you agree? 
Yes, um, yes, I, I fully agree. Uh, we, we made the experience uh, at Nuremberg Messe that uh, if you are familiar with, I always call it political engineering. If you're familiar with political engineering, it's it's uh, you are better uh, in a better situation uh, if you have to negotiate with the stakeholders. Uh, in our case, with the city and with the state of Bavaria. Um, and uh, so this is an advantage for us uh, that uh, we have this experience uh, in our um, management. Uh, yes, cool. and maybe we'll come on a little bit later to, to talk about how this um, MESA model may evolve in, in the future. But yeah, yeah. first I'd <laughs> like to, to maybe ask you, with the, the global COVID threat to the health of all our societies, yeah, that was preceded on a personal level, if you don't mind me mentioning this, because it is very important, Dr. Fleck. In 2019, when you had a most serious uh, health threat of your own, uh, it must have been quite a blow, and, and thank God you came through that. So how did that experience change your personal life and also your approach to the business uh, life? Yes, um, as a this disease, um, in fact, um, was the biggest challenge uh, in my life, definitely. Uh, it was in June 2018, June 2018, uh, when I suffered uh, an aortic dissection. It's called aort aortic dissection. Um, at that time, nine hours emergency operation, um, uh, one month artificial coma, and nine month um, uh, rehabilitation. Mm -hmm. So, nine months, uh, 10 months, uh, where I was out of the business. And uh, in April, in April uh, 2019, I came back. Um, and uh, it was a, a very good comeback, uh, because uh, all the colleagues, uh, they were happy that uh, I'm back in the business. And this was a very, uh, very good experience for me. Um, and made me possible uh, to uh, to run my business um, um, starting in 2019 again together with uh, the colleagues. And uh, uh, yes, I think this uh, was a severe impact uh, to my life and to my business life uh, as well. So my personal priorities, they changed. They changed uh, not only a little bit, they changed uh, massive. And uh, for example, for instance, I resigned from different honored posts, uh, which I had, like president of the Nuremberg State Opera Friends Association, uh, or another one treasurer of the uh, of a regional organization of the German Red Cross, and uh, things uh, like this. So it was a, a severe change in my um, uh, daily business, in my weekly business, in my monthly business. I'm sure it sounds like you appreciate the, um, the human community that is the events industry in, in that instance and the support. And it's great to hear today that you and your colleagues are also supporting your international colleagues in India, a country that's suffering particularly badly, as we know, from COVID. And yes. Tell us about this initiative uh, today, I believe, uh, that you, you launched with the oxygen boxes. Yes, uh, we, uh, we had our direct experience uh, because we have uh, regularly phone calls and uh, video meetings with our colleagues in Delhi, in uh, Mumbai and in Bangalore. Um, and um, we saw, of course, uh, like you as well, uh, the pictures uh, in the TV every day, every evening in the news. And uh, then um, we decided uh, that we have to help our colleagues uh, in these three locations which we have in India. And um, so um, we talked to, to some other companies in the region here in Nuremberg, um, whether they would be able to deliver oxygen uh, instruments and oxygen boxes uh, for this purpose. And uh, we found one, yes, uh, and uh, we ordered um, for our 50 colleagues in India, we have 50 colleagues in India, we ordered 50 
oxygen boxes, um, oxygen concentrators. Um, and um, they started today by aircraft uh, to India. So uh, we hope that uh, we will be able to help them a little bit because it's very difficult for them um, to build a bridge uh, if they have the, the infection until uh, the moment uh, when they can uh, use uh, medical services. Um, and uh, there are some hours in between, there are some days in between, uh, and uh, this bridge we can build with these instruments. And yet another great example of illustrating the power of leveraging uh, economic and political connections in the city and the region to bring them into our industry and to make such a, a powerful um, a donation there. That, that's a great example. And, uh, you know, our best wishes to your colleagues over there. Um, the pandemic has also seen our industry fast track um, event technology and virtual platforms. Tell us about um, any investments that you've been making there in uh, Nuremberg Messe in new digital services and how you think that um, event technology may change and affect the business model in future as we move surely towards more hybrid input? Yes, in fact, the pandemic is a kind of, I call it booster, booster for the digital change in our industry. Uh, and um, I'm convinced that in future, um, every exhibition will consist of two modules, two modules, a real module in halls, supported by digital tools um, and a digital module for customers uh, who will, for whatever reason, uh, not travel uh, to the venue city. And um, this picture of future in our mind, uh, we at Nuremberg Messe, uh, we are strengthening our investments um, in digital infrastructure on our venue and uh, in our digital venue itself. Um, for instance, we applied very early uh, for a 5G license in Germany, uh, which we received already last year um, in the mid of the pandemic. And uh, the purpose was, of course, uh, that we would be able in future to offer our customers communication opportunities uh, um, on a state-of-the-art te technological level. Um, and uh, this is one of the most important uh, uh, preconditions um, uh, we should have um, to be successful with a venue um, in the digital era in the future. Great. And um, yesterday we we saw in um, in in one of the other lander in Germany uh, news from North North Rhine Westphalia uh, of a, a partial reopening or prospects for that. Uh, do you think um, looking into your crystal ball as we reopen hopefully more in Europe and in Germany, of course, that we'll see local and regional fairs dominating first before the return of the full international market. And it, it certainly, I, I give you the example uh, uh, of the caravan salon uh, in Dusseldorf that was very successful, but at the end of the day, it was a national, uh, as I understand, a national exhibition. So presumably you'd agree we, we'll see the coming back of regional and national fairs before we see the international market uh, return? Yes, I think that in the, in the first phase after the pandemic, we will definitely see more regional focused fairs, definitely. Uh, but I also say human beings want to meet. Human beings want to meet wherever on the globe. Uh, and therefore, our business will have definitely, from my point of view, a successful future. And the exhibition business is nearly existing since 1,000 years, roundabout. Uh, 1,000 1, years. Mm -hmm. uh, and we have survived wars. We have survived world wars. We have survived several pandemics uh, during the centuries. So we definitely, from my point of view, will survive this current pandemic as well. And uh, what I also like to share with you is that uh, um, I personally, I 
there are different theses uh, in in the in the newspapers and and so on. But I personally, I share the thesis of uh, of, of an Italian uh, scientist. Um, perhaps you know him. It's Franco Ferrarotti. Uh, Franco Ferrarotti. Uh, he says um, he is from Rome, and he says um, the longer this pandemic will last, um, all the more intensive the explosion of the pleasure of life will be. Uh, and uh, this is what I share. I'm sure that uh, this will be the scenario uh, which we will see uh, in the first uh, and second phase after the pandemic. And I can see why Italian President uh, Mattarella named you as a Cavaliere of the Italian <laughs> Republic. <laughs> um, <laughs> you touched earlier, uh, Dr. Fleck, on, on some of the, um, the international um, operations that you're involved with, including chairman of the supervisory board in your Shanghai Nuremberg Messe, as well as um, in Sao Paulo, where you, you have interests, and in Athens, you mentioned Forum. Of all of the regions, including those ones of the world, where do you see the growth perspectives in perspectives in future? You know, it's commonly held that maybe Asia might is where we're seeing uh, the the reopening and comeback. Do you, would you agree with that analysis? Yes, yes, more or not. Yes, yes. Uh, we will think. Uh, we will see. From my point of view, we will see a growth in the future around the globe. Um, the volume of the growth in every region will depend uh, on the size and on the age pyramid of the population and as well on the political frame conditions set by the governments uh, in these different uh, countries. And yes, I am, I am prou I'm proud you mentioned it, uh, being appointed Cavaliere of Italy, thus Knight of the Republic of Italy. But nevertheless, um, I have to concede that definitely um, the best perspective for economic growth are not in Italy, are not in Germany, are not uh, in France. Um, they are in Asia uh, in the upcoming uh, one, two decades, um, in China, in India, uh, in the other Southeast Asian countries. And um, so the, the European member states, the, the EU member states, um, which I already remembered uh, before, uh, they, from my point of view, have to make a great effort uh, in the next years and in the next one, two decades um, to defend Europe's leading position in the global exhibition business. And um, if uh, these efforts uh, will be successful, there is, uh, to, from today's point of view, definitely a question. But we have do to think, hard work. We have to do, do hard think, work uh, to reach this, this goal. Do you think those trends, Dr. Fleck, would, would mean uh, that you might be looking at any acquisitions in Asia in future or, or joint ventures there in places such as Korea, Thailand? I, from my point of view, for a successful exhibition company, um, it is uh, fundamental. It is, it is definitely necessary to be present in these markets. Uh, definitely, yes. Um, and uh, yes, we are also looking for uh, opportunities to cooperate in these countries. Yes, definitely. Great. I, I see you're also a great embodiment of the, the Messrs. Catchline, born in Nuremberg, grew up in Europe, at home in the world, <laughs> living embodiment. So um, maybe we can move on to sustainability, a big issue, of course, for our industry. And um, maybe tell us a little bit about your company's approach and uh, how important it is for exhibition companies around the world to be sustainable. Yes, uh, sustainability is uh, today uh, very important and in future more important than in the past. Um, to fulfill sustainability criteria will be, from my point of view, one of the important KPIs uh, for the future for the future success of companies. Um, and of course, from my point of view, aside financial KPIs and aside market KPIs, uh, definitely. And on the one hand, 
um, we at Nuremberg Messe, we are focusing our activities more and more on the sustainability um, development uh, goals of the United Nations. We decided to do that. And on the other hand, um, I'd like to underline uh, that we are also self-confident and we know that our business model trade fairs, not only in Nuremberg, in every uh, venue uh, worldwide, uh, our business model trade fairs is making a contribution to avoid transportation-induced air pollution. Definitely, this is a fact. And um, we in our industry, we should uh, underline this fact uh, every day, every week, every month in the, in the discussions uh, with uh, the political authorities and so on. Uh, because um, in the past, uh, we, from my point of view, we were not confident enough uh, in doing this. Yes. And I'm sure that wonderful hall behind you there um, was built with that in mind. Uh, there must be some, uh, some great features there for uh, ecology and sustainability. Def definitely, yes. Uh, we have, we, uh, we have uh, with this hall, we have uh, no silver standard, we have no gold standard, we have a platinum standard um, regarding uh, the uh, standards uh, in the construction industry. Uh, so yes, um, this is uh, a very good solution uh, for uh, these um, uh, sustainability criteria. And if I may take you back into the political field for a moment and maybe see what kind of standard we can apply there. Um, you're on the UFI board and uh, UFI is an association, at least in my view, that has been extremely active in its advocacy and lobbying for our industry's interests uh, among politicians and leaders um, around the world. And uh, I think it compared, its activity has compared very favorably with some other industry associations. But do you think, uh, and putting on your old political hat for the moment, that, that our industry has got the message across to politicians and leaders sufficiently about the value of what we do in the exhibition industry how we provide platforms for the economic good. Do you think there's work to do there generally? Maybe in Germany, you're an expert in politics. And <laughs> you seem to have got the, uh, the chemistry right, but certainly in my country, politicians need a lot of convincing of the value of our industry. Yes, yes. This is uh, the same case in, in, in Germany and I uh, think um, in many other countries around the globe. It's a difficult, difficult question, yes, uh, but um, uh, to convince politicians and leaders about the value of exhibitions and uh, our exhibitions value for the economic growth, um, we have to make uh, permanent efforts um, in every of uh, our countries and um, especially uh, during the current pandemic. Um, it's uh, more and more difficult uh, to explain this. Um, to the political authorities, uh, especially regarding the decisions um, um, focusing the restart of our business. Um, this is very difficult and uh, there is still to do uh, a lot uh, to, uh, to convince uh, the, pol the politicians uh, that uh, a restart uh, with uh, um, a regime of uh, security and safety it does make sense uh, for not only our uh, sector of the economy, but for the whole economy, for the different sectors we have um, in Germany, in France, in Great Britain, in the US, uh, wherever. I'm, I'm hoping that maybe some of the mechanisms we put in place for talking to politicians will remain after the pandemic, because as you know, politicians can be transitory and, and we need uh, bridges of communication maybe to their uh, executives and the permanent people who work in their offices, which we haven't had before. So perhaps some good will come out of this situation there. Um, if I may ask, as you approach your landmark birthday, uh, and uh, I must say I've beaten you to it by a few months, uh, <laughs> uh, but what kind of advice would you pass on 
to younger managers and those starting out in their careers in the events industry? And were there any wise words that you received and remember from mentors in the industry and in the past that have helped you in your events career? Yes, I, I have, of course, I have a rich experience in different uh, sectors. You mentioned it, uh, banking sector, politics, um, exhibition business, yes. And in every sector, I uh, received uh, some advices uh, which were helpful for me and for my career, yes. And uh, younger colleagues in our business, um, I would recommend two things. Uh, first, always make jobs which you enjoy. When you do jobs which you enjoy, you can be successful. And second one, from my point of view, second recommendation, always uh, pursue pertinaciously your goals. Uh, this is also very important. There are, of course, many other device advices, uh, but uh, these two, from my point of view, are the most basic ones. And are they... Um, uh do you, do you bring those principles into your teaching? I gather yet another string to your bow is uh, lecturing at uh, Midweide University of Applied Sciences in Saxony. How would you describe your own personal style of teaching and mentoring when you're talking to, to younger students? Yes, um, I like to work with uh, young people at the university um, and it's a challenge uh, and a pleasure as well for me. Um, it's useful uh, for this next generation when I can share my personal experience uh, of my professional life with them. And it's also vice versa, useful for me, for, me, for myself, um, if uh, I can um, discuss uh, some questions with them um, and with these students um, uh, regarding the future of uh, our business and the future of our country and the future of, of the globe. Um, so I personally, I do not only uh, do my lectures, uh, I also like to discuss uh, actual issues with the students. And this is uh, uh, the most important aspect uh, when I, I, I'm active uh, at the university. Thank you, thank you. And Germany, when I came into this industry 16 years ago, the MESA model was held up as the ultimate model to aspire to uh, around the world, a classic system of support for running events and exhibition halls and companies. Does this model, however, need reforming or changing? Um, and if so, how? How do you see it going forward? Um, I, I don't think so. Um, I'm convinced that our German model will be successful in the future as well. Um, investments in exhibition halls, from my point of view, are in principle, in principle uh, a public duty. Uh, there may be individual cases where this is possible in a private manner, yes, but in principle, uh, it's a public duty. And um, the most successful model um, is the duality of public owned venues on the one hand and a mixture of public and private events on the other hand. Uh, this duality is very successful and will, from my point of view, also stay very successful uh, in the future time. And would you say, Dr. Fleck, that the masses have been successful in obtaining uh, the necessary finances to weather this pandemic because of that political relationship? Has it been uh, more useful than not? Um, it's definitely useful because our stakeholder structure is stable. It's definitely stable. And so we are able um, to be successful in uh, this challenging time uh, like the pandemic. Uh, we, um, many of, of uh, the colleagues uh, I know, um, they, we all have our risk management systems uh, in, in the exhibition companies. But um, I, to be frankly open, uh, we had many risks uh, in our risk management system, but we don't have COVID in our, <laughs> among our risks. Um, so 
this was a very surprising um, development for us um, last year. And we uh, had to take decisions. Um, we had to cut costs. We had to cut uh, uh, personal um, uh, costs. Uh, we had to reduce investments and so on. Um, and uh, this was necessary, uh, like uh, with every other uh, company um, and exhibition company around the globe. Um, and uh, it was an advantage for us, yes, to have stable stakeholders, uh, but we um, nevertheless, we were forced uh, to uh, take decisions uh, on the um, business administration uh, sector um, re regarding cost cutting and investment cutting and so on. Um, this is uh, the case, but uh, yes, I think uh, uh, it's a certain kind of advantage uh, in these challenging times, especially. Yes. My final question, Dr. Fleck, and thank you for, for your time. It's been great chatting away. Uh, despite all of your globe trotting and your experience uh, in uh, building international railways, international trade, um, trade fair business, uh, I'd like to ask you about your own, uh, when, if and when you get any quiet time of your own and with your family, your about your hobbies and interests. Now, you did mention classical music, which is not one of my own fortes, but what, what did spark up my interest was when I saw your name on the board of FC Nuremberg. Now, I know this team is not in the Bundesliga one, but yes. <laughs> you must be a fan. And um, just as the German Messe system has been built up as an example for the world, um, have German football clubs got the right ownership model in particular I'm speaking as an Englishman, when we see the mess that English, Spanish and Italian leading clubs have got themselves into with the aborted Super League project. What is your view on that and on the FC Nuremberg? Yes, thank you very much for, for, for this question. In fact, there is a, a real competitive landscape today in the football business. Uh, football today is, is sports, sports, yes, but it's uh, especially business. Um, and uh, we have in Germany, in Nuremberg as well, a long history with traditional football clubs focusing on the on sports, not on business. Mm -hmm. The challenge is to manage a kind of migration process um, to a fully professional organizational structure um, for the clubs. And there in Germany, uh, not for all, but for many uh, of the football clubs, is still a huge potential uh, for further development. And uh, the, to be open, uh, especially also in my hometown, Nuremberg, also for the FCN. Yes, there's always a link between the exhibition business and football. I remember Leipzig Messe managed to win the bid for holding the draw, I think when Germany hosted the, the Euro uh, Championships once. Yes, so there's always yes. an angle there. <laughs> well, I wish your team the very best of luck and I wish you, of course, many happy returns on, is it the 26th, your, your birthday? Your, yes, on 26th, yes. So yes, we, yes. Will, we will raise a, a Steiner for you in Mash Media Towers in London. And, thank you, thank you uh, very much. Again, for your great, great. and insights. And I look forward to meeting you in person before too long. So best of luck, uh, Dr. Fleck, and thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, it was great to have this interview with you. With you. All the best for Exhibition World. Prost. Thank you. <laughs>